I'm Mike Papantonio, and this is Ring of Fire. The Obama administration has spent more time and resources going after whistleblowers than they have Wall Street criminals, and we'll take a look at the administration's war on whistleblowers and why they're doing that. We're going to take a look at the disastrous policy ideas of conservative author Ayn Rand in America's South, and we'll find out how a handful of Republican governors are bringing Rand's vision to life. And the GOP has a plan that they think is going to keep them in power for generations, even as they shift their ideologies further and further to the right. We'll bring you the details of that scheme. We have all that and more coming up, but right now, you've just entered the ring of fire. You can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. Grand jury secrecy rules. For political gain. The press can find out. That has nothing to do with politics, but go ahead. It wouldn't bother me. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> the former Bush administration launched a war that most of the media ignored, and that was a war on whistleblowers. Unfortunately, President Obama has continued that war, and attorneys Howard Nation and Dave Tissell are with me now to talk about the continued assault on government whistleblowers. Howard, the Obama administration uh, has done a miserable job. Uh, where, 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 if you think about this, they are actually going after whistleblowers, trying to prosecute whistleblowers for coming forward with information about government misconduct. I mean, the, la the, the case that really strikes at you is where you had a CIA officer just recently get 30 months in prison because he publicly identified one, a, an intelligence operative that was engaged in the worst kind of illegal torture uh, of prisoners. Now, rather than, rather than going after that person who was involved in the illegal conduct, they went after the whistleblower. That seems to be the brand of this Obama administration is going after the wrong people all the time. Uh, what is your take on this? this? This is an infuriating story. Six, six times the Obama administration has done that, more than any administration in, in, in the recent, in recent history. Well, you're talking about the case of John Kiriakou, who was a counterterrorism agent operative for the CIA in Pakistan, and he had been successful in helping to bring down leadership of Al Qaeda. He was very much opposed to the con to to torture, and this was during a time when um, the Cheney Bush administration was saying, "We're not torturing. We're not torturing. We're not torturing." So he exposed the fact that there was torture, that it was waterboarding. He took it to journalists, and then he later wrote a book about it showing that it was, in fact, a designed system of gathering information. It was not a few rogues. The result of that was the result of his disclosing their violations of the Constitution and their misconduct was that he is now serving 30 months in prison. It's outrageous. So Dave, Dave, you saw, you actually saw Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, all of the big armaments industry, the arms dealers uh, that, that have these huge government contracts. They're the ones pushing this administration to actually go after whistleblowers who are telling the truth about, about, about government squandering money. Uh, tell me about the, the, the trailblazer uh, is, is, is a great example, the, the trailblazer story where you actually had, uh, w we know for a fact that uh, approaching several billion dollars worth of money was simply squandered away on a system because you had a general, a fellow named Hayden, that had such a close relationship with, with private contractors that he blew it. He blew all this money on a system that didn't even work. Tell us a little bit about that story. Well, this is absolutely extraordinary, Mike. The Trailblazer program was a program that, that really was a boondoggle that lost billions of dollars for the American taxpayer. And what we saw in 2001, at the very time that uh, the chatter was leading up to 9-11, uh, of there being a possible terrorist strike in the United States was that we were learning uh, that, or we did not know, that Trailblazer was a new program that General Hayden had uh, attempted to put into place to privatize 
to t to give as mm. a as a handout basically to the to the big companies to the McDonnell Douglases to the Boeings of the world uh, and basically privatize our national security and in doing that leading up to 9/11 it left uh, us without an ability to actually learn about all the chatter that was going on and what we actually learned later is that Trailblazer was turned on the American public and when this was uh, disclosed by the NSA-4, I think is who we're talking about here today, uh, a number of, of uh, officials within the industry uh, who, who exposed, in the government, who exposed that the Trailblazer program was not only a boondoggle in terms of losing money, uh, but it actually didn't work. And So, uh, Howard, this, Howard, let me go to you on that. Dave lays it out very well. You had, a pro, you had a program that didn't work. You had a general that wanted to privatize what government is supposed to be doing because in the end, the end of the story, let me get to it, is General Hayden now is working as a private contractor for some of these very same people. But if you want to follow the money on this story, it's arguable that General Hayden's failure actually was part of the problem for the 9-11 disaster because we had something called Thin Thread. Right. Thin Thread was a system that, that did work. Thin, thin uh, Thread was a system that we knew was we were able to, t to keep up with chatter. We were able to, t to get in all of this information, these snippets from all over the world, process them quickly and figure out what was going on. We could have picked up, picked up that chatter through Thin Thread, but instead you had General Hayden that wanted to, to, to reward his buddies and he came forward with Trailblazer. Uh, lay that out for us a little bit. Thin Thread, it was a system that was in place working, wasn't it? This is a classic example of trying to reward outside contractors by replacing a system that is working. Thin Thread was the in-house uh, system designed by NSA geniuses, really, uh, and it was working beautifully. And the fact is that Thin Thread, as it was working, uh, General Hayden came in and said, no, you know, we're going to change this thing over. We're going to stop using the system designed by in-house government workers that have been working forever and working highly effectively. We're going to replace it. We're going to outsource this. And we're going to bring up this new system called Trailblazer. Now, the problem with it was that at the time of the transition leading up to 911, there was nothing in place as a result of Hayden's decision. Hayden then put Trailblazer into place. The people who designed, the whistleblowers in this case, were the people who had designed and implemented and run Thin Thread successfully for years. They came forth and they said, this is not working, it's a boondoggle, it, there's, there's, corrupt, uh, there's corruption going on here in the bidding. And then they learned, just amazingly, that the NSA system had begun using, doing domestic spying, totally unconstitutional, that they had turned this thin thread uh, system around and they had started using it against the American public. When Dave, let me go to you yeah. here. So, so all of a sudden, the people who want to do the right thing, these, these very talented, long experienced, great long history of successful uh, scientific engineering on systems like this, they come forward and they say, wait a second. We want to report the fact that General Hayden, A, is a fool, B, might be involved in some type of, uh, of relationship with the contractors that needs to be looked at. And instead of the Obama administration, instead of Eric Holder doing anything about that, they go after the whistleblowers, don't they? They go after the whistleblowers and they try to, they try to, f to, to further this effort to privatize this system that in the past has been completely run by governments very successfully, by the way. This is absolutely correct. And this is what the travesty of this entire story is. None of these people, none of these four, have been prosecuted for leaking any confidential information, any information that is harmful to national security. What they've done is they are American truth tellers who are willing to come forward, who are willing to protect the American people at the expense of their own jobs, at the expense of their own careers. And they have been prosecuted in a way that has ruined their careers when 
The law would not allow them to be fired if they were in place. That is what is the travesty of what the Obama administration and Eric Holder has done uh, in prosecuting more whistleblowers within the government than any president or administration before him. Well, Howard, this is the only way we find out, isn't it? We only find out by way of whistleblowers. In this situation, what we found out was not only was their corruption, but the corruption might have led to the to the action to 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 9/11 by not catching the information that we could and should have caught prior to 9/11. This story seems to get worse in the sense that there is a movement by government to privatize, not by the government, by, certainly by the neocon right, to privatize everything, whether it's education, uh, wh whether it's our water systems, our air, you name it, they want to privatize it. Here, they simply want to privatize what government has done successfully for a long time, and it was a disaster, wasn't it? Well, the Office of the Inspector General investigated this debacle, and they found that resources were wasted on Trailblazer in the billions of dollars, and interestingly, even the Office of the uh, Inspector General kept it confidential as to how many billions were wasted on Trailblazer. They found that NSA had overlooked fraud and abuse, and they found that NSA had suppressed positive studies regarding thin thread, and that's NSA and General Hayden. The OIG found also that among the people at NSA now, that there was a fear of prosecution when they were even talking to the inspector general who, is, who were investigating this, and they found that essentially the NSA had missed 911 as a result of this. Dave, is there any question in your mind after taking a look at this story, General Hayden's relationship now to that private industry that does the very thing that he tried to launch? Now again, General Hayden was given the choice, do we go forward with a system that works? Do we use the technology, the, the technology and the technicians who came up with that system, that seem, thin thread that seems to work just fine, or do we throw it out the window and go towards this movement to give this entire program to privatization? In a minute, tell me your quick take on it. There, there is no question in my mind that although this was a huge failure for the American people, it was a big win for General Hayden and for his cronies who made off very well. Isn't this something the media just completely ignored? We're telling this story, but go back and find how often the corporate media told this story, the people who take I mean, advertisement money from all these contractors. Absolutely, the American people have to speak up because this story has been kept from them. And in fact, the Obama administration has been lump lumping the press with the spies through the 1917 Espionage Act and basically saying that giving out information to the press is worse than actually selling secrets to the enemy. Wow. That letting the, letting the public actually know what's going on is worse than selling secrets to the enemy. This and, has and, to be stopped. Well, we have to do it, and the only way we can do it is telling this story. Dave, Howard, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just ahead, we'll find out why right-wing icon Ayn Rand would feel right at home in the South today. We'll be right back with more Ring of Fire. Welcome back to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. Republicans have a stranglehold on state governments throughout the South. Because of this, they've been able to implement all sorts of policies that would make Ayn Rand weep with joy. Joining me now to talk about the new Ayn Rand paradise in the South is investigative journalist Rick Outson. Rick. Ayn Rand is alive and well in Tennessee and actually all over the South, but what in the hell is happening in Tennessee? Uh, I mean, they're like last in everything. 
last in education, first in poverty, that type of stuff. How, how have they gotten there? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's Tennessee. You know, it's, they, they're still trying to figure out how shoes fit. But they've got some of the biggest nuts in their legislature. It's, it's completely controlled by the Republicans. They've got 99 seats in the House. 70 of them are uh, Republicans in the Tennessee Senate. 26 or 33 cents are, uh, seats are Republicans. And the leader of the pack is this Stacy Campfield out of the Knoxville area who's come up with a bill he calls, he, he ties education and poverty together, Mike, but not in the way that most normal people would. He wants to limit people's uh, temporary assistance to needy families. He wants to tie it to the kids' performance in school. If, they are, if they're not making the grades, the family gets hit with a 30% deduction. And Tennessee is one of the lowest states in the union in paying this kind of assistance. Okay, so you have, it, but, but it's not simply one person that drives it. This character, from, uh, from what I understand, is, is an interesting character uh, in, in the <laughs> sense that he's, he's just got, he's, he has all the, the neo-nut uh, papers. But really what's happening down in Tennessee is what's happening all over the South, and that is that this new, this new Ayn Rand policy of the poor are poor because they want to be, right. and the rich are rich because they're so damn smart and they're so clever. And so what they've done is they've, they've destroyed education down there. Little, I, when I said, when I opened the show, I think they're 49th in education, uh, somewhere around right. 47th, 48th as, as far as teacher pay. Uh, jobs, there are no jobs in Tennessee. And you still have the legislators trying to, to ratchet down all of the money, take all of the money that, that, that they should be getting in, tax, in taxpayer revenues, making those revenues disappear by enabling the, the wealthy to pay little or no taxes up there. Instead, of, they have a sales tax up there, don't they? Right. It's, you know, we know what sales tax does. It takes money from the poor and they put limits on the upper end so the rich don't have to pay as much tax on their purchases because they're paying more money. But you know what we're looking at in this bill, which fortunately didn't get through the Tennessee legislature, but it's going to be brought up again, uh, it, the public, call, the opponents call it starve the children bill. But it really is, you know, it's, it's double talk on everything, Mike. I mean, this weekend, not only do they not have jobs, but their governor closed, started closing their career training centers. 36 of those centers in the state of Tennessee are now going to be closed by the end of June. So they say they want to have a workforce. They say they want to have education, but they don't want to do it. It's everyone's, they're exceptional. Everyone else is failures and it's their own fault. And they feel no obligation to help the welfare of the, of the entire well, state. Well, actually now it's, it's, it's gotten to the point to where they're actually in Tennessee blaming their high unemployment, what, worst, one of the worst in the United States. They're blaming their high unemployment on the fact that they're just saying that people don't want to work. But when you drill down and look at the job opportunities, industry doesn't want to go there. Uh, culture doesn't want to go there. Why would anybody, why would you want to build a, a university in a setting like that? Why would you want to build your corporation in a setting like that? There's no attraction to anybody who thinks. And so, so all of a sudden now the, the, the attack is to say, well, the, these, the, these families who are on, on, on assistance from the state, we're going to punish them if their children don't do better in school. And as a matter of fact, when the first time it came out, they were getting ready to blame. It, the same would hold true for handicapped children, children for disability. They made right. no distinction at all on who would be hit with this. But I mean, to me, the bigger story to me about this, uh, uh, Rick, is that is that you have this idea, this new po Southern policy so vibrant and so alive in the South. It is this notion that by God, poor people can, can stay poor. We've got ours, we're gonna keep ours. It's worse in the South, I really do believe, than any place in the country that we, we, when you look at the statistics. Well, I think it is. It's, you know, this is the testing ground. This is the bellwether states. We, if it could pass here, then it's gonna go to Ohio, go to Wisconsin. They're gonna move it to the other states. But, but my you know, what's even more interesting to me are the characters that push these laws. This yeah, Stace, talk about this fellow. Oh, talk Stace, about this fellow push. <laughs> Stacy Campfield, 44-year-old, lifelong bachelor, never been married, 
Catholic Christian, meaning that he's, he's Christian and he's Catholic, but he never goes to Mass. Uh, his, his total source of income is his legislative salary from being a state senator and 15 properties that he leases or rents out in the Knoxville area, which have been cited by the city. And he's been sued by tenants, but he's exceptional. He, you know, he's the perfect disciple of Ayn Rand. And it's just amazing these kind of guys. He's the one who wanted to do the bill, don't say gay in school. That AIDS cannot be, be caught by anyone through heterosexual sex. Uh, he's, he's Todd Aiken on steroids is what we're dealing well, with. But what we're seeing this is state by state. If you were to go to, for example, you, you've, you've covered, uh, you've done a lot of reporting on Rick Scott down right. in Florida. You've seen what Rick Scott is capable of. But if you go state to state, especially these red states, and you take a look at what has happened in the last 10 years, don't you see this pattern of them kind of going to the bottom, the, kind of the, the bottom of the apple well, bringing up the worst apples, and then those are the people because, that running the state because they have money, because they're ideologues, because they can be bossed around, because they have no conscience, right. because they are all fully in to this idea of, of division in this country between the haves and the have-nots. Don't you see that state to state, whether you go to Arkansas, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, it just repeats itself again and again. It's almost as if the people in power, the big PAC money, the big Koch brother types, these are the, the, these are the lowest common denominators that they're looking for right. to run state politics, isn't it? Don't you yeah, see that yeah, state to state, Rick? I agree. That's who they seek out in these legislatures. And then, of course, as they become more and more one party state governments, it becomes harder and harder to get any voice of reason in the mix. But you're right, they single out these characters, pump them up, give them the money they need. Uh, there's people that you would never want to be next to. Uh, Stacy Campbell, I got one story that you got here. He went to a Tennessee football game. He was wearing a Mexican wrestling match going to the ball game, and he so creeped out the women sitting around him that they, the campus police had to remove him from the football game. I mean, this is a this is a guy they put in the position of leadership, and I'm exactly. just telling, well, oh, oh, if you if you look at the story, what about Rick Scott? Rick Scott in Florida stole. I mean, the company that he was the CEO of stole 1.4 billion dollars right. from taxpayers. The voters in Florida knew that they that this company had stolen the money. This is a governor who had to plead. Uh, the Fifth Amendment 78 times. In other words, pleading, saying, I can't tell you the truth because if I do, I could go to prison for criminal conduct. Nevertheless, they elect him governor of the state. Now, that didn't just happen. It happened because the PAC money came into a state like Florida, just like they're going into Tennessee. Right. They're identifying the, re the really craziest ideologues. The, the, the people that they think they can manipulate, the Herman Cain types, the Sarah Bachman types. They're trying to find these people they can easily manipulate, put out front, and then they're, they're trying to push the threshold of crazy. Now, you've done a lot of reporting on the South. Okay. Uh, that's, that seems to, that's one of your specialties in right. reporting. Is that something I'm just imagining, or are we seeing a trend with that? No, it's, it's, we've been seeing it going on. Mike, we, you're, Rick Scott, Rick Perry. Bobby Jindal, Haley Barber. I mean, these characters are, are out of a, um, a bad Southern movie. All the King's men, they, they, couldn't even, they would be crazy even in that world. Uh, and you're right. But we, they, talk, we, talk, we talk about it flippantly, but the truth is there's been a design here, isn't there? Oh, I think so. You can see the pattern in all of them. I mean, we, they all fight to who can get further right than the next so that they can get more praise from the Tea Parties, from the Koch brothers movement. But, you know, and the other thing with Rick Scott, he spent 70 million of his own dollars to get elected governor. And, and, and most of these people do. When we take right. a look at each one of these candidates, uh, a guy like Rick Perry came in with such huge pack money from the Koch brother type organizations that, I mean, it wasn't even a fair fight. But, I, okay, isn't part of the problem here, Rick, that the, the, the Republicans have given up trying to change America by, by federal standards. They, 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 they don't think they can change America in national elections. So they take a place like Tennessee and they right. say, we're gonna change Tennessee, we're gonna change Florida, we're gonna change Alabama, we're gonna change this whole red state kind of confederacy of dunces. And once we do that, we will have changed politics. You've written about that a lot, haven't you? You're right, and these are, these are the same. Once they get control of the state government, then they start pushing for state rights. 
You'll hear the secession talk. You hear that we don't need the federal government until a disaster happens. But as long as they can, they don't need federal government. They don't need the president. And they, they're really focusing on state rights, pretending they're going to secede, and even pushing their agenda at the state level down to the local level. They want to have control over the entire state. Well, talk about that. Lo talk about the local level, le level politicians. We miss the fact that they started trying to pack the education uh, systems, the uh, Board of Education. Then they came and they tried to pack the city council, which they succeeded in. Then they came and they tried to pack the county commissioners, which they succeeded in. So Democrats have been sitting fat, dumb and happy right. looking the other way as you've had this, this, this trend to put people into power like Rick Scott, to go ahead, get control of the court systems, get control of the councils, get control of the educational system, and they've been doing it state by state. At this point, don't you think it's more probable that uh, you know the Republican leadership f simply feels they can, thump their, they can thumb their nose at what happens nationally because they're taken over state by state? I think you're right, and, and, and it works too, because the other element of this is the redistricting. By controlling all these state legislatures, they got to. They were able to dictate who got to stay in Congress and who didn't. They've been doing the same thing to keep their jobs in the legislature by removing these district lines. They restricted the amount of people who could vote in the state of Florida. By having this complete control, it becomes the worst nightmare for democracy because it becomes an you know, meritocracy. They, they are deciding what's best for all of us and, and taking care of their pals and, and corporations. And so right now, as we go into federal elections, uh, Howard Dean, this last go around said, uh, you know, basically, you know, we may, we may uh, progressives may win on a federal level, but they're, they're, they're being trounced. They're being defeated in local elections all the way down to dog catchers, basically, because that has been part of the Republican plan. Howard Dean talked about that plan years and years ago and everybody ignored it. Uh, you're a writer who's followed it. The truth is, it is a bad situation. Rick Outson, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Mike. When we come back, we'll find out more about how Republicans are trying to rig our electoral system by redistricting. I'm Mike Papantonio, and you're watching Ring of Fire. We'll be right back. You're watching Free Speech TV, a network powered by the people. Welcome back to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. In the past, when a lawmaker became too extreme for their own good, the voters would boot that person out of office. But thanks to Republican gerrymandering, extreme views are allowed to stay in state and in Washington. I have attorney Neil McCarthy with me now to talk about how dangerous this new trend is for democracy. Game is changed, Neil. We now have, uh, we, we have the Republican neocon leadership understanding that the fight is not taking place at the federal level. They're more than happy to simply spread the fight out state to state, change politics state to state. You have redistricting, obviously a big factor, but you also have the, the very, very right wing media that is on the rise. And of course you have PAC money coming into the game to change all of the, all of the politics of the day. Uh, how, 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 how much inroad has the Republican uh, uh, right made in changing the way that politics places, takes place in America? Well, they've made a tremendous amount of inroads. I mean, the core problem now with the Republican Party is they are not motivated uh, by the public opinion. They're not motivated by fixing problems. They're motivated by responding to their core constituency, which has grown over the past decade into a very limited group uh, of elite conservative uh, uh, groups that fund them. So uh, what do we see then? Uh, we see a very myopic party with a very limited view, but they're very successful in that they have a campaign, as you mentioned, to go state by state uh, and try to gain ground where they can't gain that ground on the federal side. You almost see them, uh, for example, in the last gun battle that we saw in Washington, 90% of the American public, actually it's actually higher than 
believe that background checks were important. They want to do away with assault rifles. But you have the Republican politicians there in the House and in the Senate that say, you know, we really don't care about public opinion. That's where it is nowadays. You have uh, you have a political game to where you have politicians in place that say, you know, we really do not care about public opinion. It's gotten that to that point, hasn't it? Yeah, and, and the example you use is probably the saddest example, uh, uh, the gun control debate. Uh, there was a proposal that was real reform, which was a ban on assault rifles. That had no chance. Uh, and then we went down to a very watered down bill, which was a bill to simply perform background checks on those buying weapons on the internet. 90% of Americans supported that. But because of opposition by the Koch brothers and particularly the NRA, we saw some real political cowardice. Uh, we saw people who ran for cover simply because the NRA went in there and said, you know what, if you, if you support this, a yes vote will draw our wrath. And we will, we will do everything possible to make sure you're not reelected. That threat alone caused a no vote. Uh, and again, it was a very, very modest bill, uh, a bill that most of Americans supported but because of where we are today with the Republican Party, it went down. Neil, in the past, we would at least see the Republicans, no matter how crazy right wing they were, they would say, you know, at some point we still have to, repub we have to respond to public debate. We have to respond to public opinion. But if you have a Republican Party that doesn't really care they absolutely don't care about the national platform. They simply, all they care about what's going to happen in state primaries, what's going to happen to my very right-wing candidate in state primaries. How does politics ever move forward if they, they, they say we're willing, completely willing to ignore public opinion, totally? Yeah. Well, right now it's not moving forward. We're in a situation where we have gridlock in Washington worse than it's been in decades. Uh, we have a situation where modest proposals can't get through, uh, and we have continued alienation. So th there is not a path forward right now federally. So if you're asking me what my thought of the fix is, the first fix is campaign finance reform. Uh, since Citizens United, and we've ushered in this era uh, of you know, wealth controlling elections uh, and unlimited spending uh, and attack pieces on candidates that have, they're not remotely tethered to the truth, we have a very uh, skewed electorate. So number one uh, is campaign finance reform. And number two, frankly, is the Democratic Party needs to stick to its core principles. You know, the Democratic Party uh, can be too easily moved to the center when the Republicans aren't moving uh, at all. And the more the, the Democrats move on issues uh, that benefit corporations and, and issues that are not in consumers' best interest, the more emboldened the Republicans are. So we've got to do a better job at holding the line. Well, what you have is, for, to add to that, Neil, you also have a, uh, you have a media and the media keeps trying to sell this idea that America is a center right, that they're center right and they're, they're, they're very conservative on issues to the right. And, you know, so we have to, as politicians, we have to, as a media, we have to re adjust to that. But that's not accurate, is it? The Amer American public really is not center right at all. As a matter of fact, if anything, they're center, maybe even a little bit to the left on things like economic issues, aren't they? Yeah, if you take a look at, at all the polling, the national polls, uh, all the respected pollsters, America has moved to center left. There's really no two ways about it. You know, the Republican arguments are, you know, let's wait till 1980 comes again. Well, it's not coming back. Uh, the country has changed. Uh, immigration has changed. Uh, how people vote has changed. Uh, and you have a, um, a situation now where people are, you know, spinning this idea that, look, we're a center right country. We're a center right country. Let's get back there. Well, in the middle part of the country, that may be true. Uh, but on, certainly on the edges, on the coast, uh, and most of America, that is not true. So, uh, how do you combat that? Well, you try to get your news from a legitimate news source. I mean, you, know, you mentioned um, Fox News. Uh, that's not news, that's opinion. Uh, you know, we, th there's some of that on the Democratic side as well. But if you're looking for objective facts, uh, you've got to go to an entity that will provide you those. Uh, and those who rely on the Fox Newses of the world 
uh, to get their real world information or just getting a skewed picture. Well, as a matter of fact, if you take a look at where the trends are going in the United States, if you if you think about it, uh, Neil, the last election, uh, Democratic House candidates were able to get 1.4 million more votes than Republicans. I mean, that's a pretty good indication right there. The only reason they didn't take control of the House, as we've talked about so many times, is gerrymandering. But isn't that vote alone, the fact that there's 1.4 million uh, more votes that took place, isn't that very significant in telling us where the country has moved on things like uh, same-sex marriage, uh, immigration, certainly gun control? Uh, th th these are issues that used to be owned and operated by the Republicans, and that simply doesn't work anymore, does it? Yeah, I, I think that vote was particularly telling. And unless you look at the popular vote numbers and really dig into those, um, you may be a little bit misguided by the fact that Republicans still have the House. I mean, you mentioned uh, the gerrymander. Uh, both sides gerrymander. The, the Republicans are just a lot more shameless at it. Uh, and in 2010, we saw some districts drawn uh, that disenfranchise tens of thousands of Democratic voters. Their votes were just put uh, in a re safe Republican district where they were wasted, um, much more so than you know, the voter fraud and all the things we talk about uh, on Election Day. So the Republicans are very good at gerrymandering. But again, the issue is how are people actually voting? Uh, people are voting more and more Democratic. Well, uh, if you look, Neil, if you take a look at, uh, along with things like same-sex marriage, gun control, uh, if you take a look at the economic issues, Americans are overwhelmingly in favor of the wealthy paying more taxes, of corporations carrying more their share of the taxes, overwhelmingly they're in favor of that. Overwhelmingly, they're in favor of the idea that we don't cut Social Security and we don't cut Medicare. So these are issues that we don't have to guess about, but nevertheless, and it shows a clear movement to the left, but you still have the CNN, the ABC, the CBS, the NBC, trying to sell us this idea that the American public is center right. It's nonsense, it's ridiculous, but there's a reason that the media wants to sell that to us, I suppose, isn't there? Well, there, there, there's a reason, in my particular view, is that the media is no, no longer what it was, once was, which was an objective purveyor of information. Uh, the media is influenced now in many ways by corporate America, uh, by who their funders are, uh, if you look, took a look at the New York Times yesterday, uh, there was a piece that the Koch brothers are trying to buy the LA Times, the Ch Chicago Tribunes, a couple of uh, your papers in Florida. And, and what's the purpose of that? The purpose of that is not to give out objective reporting. The purpose of that uh, is to get their view, their partisan view to the American people. Uh, so unfortunately, the media uh, in many ways has become compromised. Well, compromise to the fact that we can't really, if you turn on the nightly news, for example, this week, no question the hunt, a uh, manhunt was critically important. No question the bombing uh, in, in, in Boston was horrendous. But while that story is being told again and again in this effort to uh, compete for eyeballs, in the effort to sell more ads, think of the stories that were missed. I mean, just right off, you, you missed the fact that the president of the United States had signed off on legislation that said that, that 20, 28,000 government workers at the very highest level have no reason to disclose their financial conflict interests. Now, this is a president that, that campaigned on the idea that transparency is critical. But while that was taking place, in secret, you had the president sign off on legislation that gave the government workers this incredible right never to show any transparency at all. Don't we see the media playing into the hands of, of politics like that all the time. Keep the eyes on the story. It's almost like the shiny thing. Keep your eyes on the shiny thing and ignore all these other things that are taking place, like cuts to Social Security, cuts to Medicare, our president giving just incredible deals to government contractors. That also took place last week, where he basically gave government contractors another form of immunity in several, several issues of legislation. But isn't that, isn't that part of the game that we, that we get sucked into every time? Oh, there's no question that's part of the game. The game is uh, what sells advertisements? If I'm print media, if I'm uh, electronic media, how do I get more advertisements? And what do the people want to hear? And what you're talking about 
uh, are very valid uh, public interest stories, stories where there's violations of the Sunshine Laws that frankly didn't get reported anywhere. Uh, and it's part of you know, the dumbing down uh, of the presentation of politics to, to our citizens, which is a shame. Um, you know, the fundamental question here is who is going to govern? Uh, and in America, we've always had majority rule, you know, majority rule, minority representation. And through the media, um, through the Koch brothers, through Citizens United, we're seeing a situation where uh, the, the minority here, the Republicans, have stalemated our government. Uh, and it's a shame. And now, as you point out, we have the Koch brothers coming in. They say, gee whiz, it's worked for us really well these last 10 years. Now we're going to buy up the rest of the newspapers, the most important newspapers in this country, and make it work even better for the neocon right. Neil, thank you for joining me. Thank you very much, Michael. Coming up, we're going to expose the myths being used to sell the Keystone XL pipeline. I'm Mike Papantonio. We'll be right back with more Ring of Fire. Welcome back to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. The time is up for Americans to submit their comments to the State Department on the Keystone XL pipeline. And soon we'll have a decision from the White House on whether or not this pipeline is going to be constructed. Joining me now to talk about the disasters of the Keystone XL pipeline is Farron Cousins, the executive editor of Trial Lawyer magazine. Farron, it looks like there have been more lies packed into selling the Keystone Pipeline than just about anything I've seen in the recent 10 years. I mean, it has just been an all-out lie fest about what this pipeline is supposed to do for America. What's your take on it? Well, the oil industry and the Republicans have been selling Keystone to us for about two and a half years now, and they want us to believe that it's going to fix every single problem that America faces. The very first talking point that they threw out was uh, mid-2011 when they told us that the Keystone Pipeline was going to bring 20,000 jobs into America. And the timing of this is important because that was at a time when the hot button issue was jobs. Republicans were angry with Obama saying that he wasn't doing enough to create jobs. And so they end up coming up with this $20,000 figure or 20,000 job figure. But the truth is, a couple weeks later, TransCanada came out and said, well, maybe it's not 20,000, maybe it's only 6,000. <laughs> and then we find out recently from the State Department that it would only create 35 permanent jobs in America. I mean, you get that many jobs opening up a, a car dealership. So this, well, this isn't, but this, this is an all-out push, though, isn't it, Farron? I mean, the Republicans probably feel like they're in striking distance because they have a president that caves into virtually everything they ask, that they ask for. Uh, you have Democrats that are so tied into the oil industry that they want this to happen. But the way this is taking place, uh, we're missing. I mean, the things we're missing are obvious. First of all, the jobs lie. It was a total lie. You realize at one point there were numbers as high as 250,000 jobs that were supposed to be created by this. They actually testified that in front of the Senate, in some front of Senate hearings. They fed that message to the media and the, the dysfunctional corporate media actually sold that idea. The other thing, though, was that this was going to reduce our, our, our cost of fuel in the United States. Talk about that lie. It was a huge <laughs> one, wasn't it? Well, that was one of their best ones. They said, look, we're going to bring in all this tar sands oil. It's coming into America. This is our oil. But nobody stopped to think why we're running this pipeline directly underneath Midwest oil refineries and taking it down to the Gulf Coast. Now, reason, that your, your point is they're going through refineries that we already have. They're existing right. in the Midwest. They're operating in the Midwest, but they want to take it to the Gulf Coast. What, for what reason other than export? 
Okay. Uh, well, that's the reason they're taking it to the Gulf Coast because we've got access to ships and they're going to send it out. Now, oil in the Midwest refineries typically stays in America and they're going directly past those to the Gulf Coast so they can ship it out. And what's gonna happen then, according to all the reports available on this, is that every time we export oil from the United States, it raises our gasoline prices anywhere between eight and 12 cents per gallon. And they're gonna be either sending this to emerging markets in China or India, or doing the typical Koch brother scheme where they load it up into the tankers, take it offshore, wait for prices to go up, and then they're gonna sell it back to Americans. But then you've got, but then you also have that element we talked about on the last show is America stu too stupid for democracy. And the question is, when you, when, you ask, uh, when you ask Americans, gee, if we drill for oil here, if we produce oil here in the United States, isn't it going to lower the cost of oil? And just the opposite is true because those people who do all that, they want to get as much as they can. So they send it to Asia, Europe, wherever they can make the most money. Has nothing to do with our prices here in the United States, does it? Well, well, that's right. And that's, you know, oil is not like any other good created. Oil is not sold on a local domestic market. Oil is sold nationally. Anything we pull out of the ground in America is going to go to OPEC, get priced by OPEC, and then sold to the highest bidder. If we're not the highest bidder, we don't keep our oil. Right now, we are a net oil exporter uh, for our domestic reserves, and we're importing oil from other places. So yes, we're pumping oil out of the ground right now at an unprecedented rate. I think domestic drilling has reached a 30 year high at this point in this country. Farron, in about a, about a minute and a half, about a minute and a half, tell us how, what a huge environmental impact this has in the United States for the area that's crossing. Well, the most important part of the Keystone Pipeline is that it crosses a portion of the Ogallala Water Aquifer, which provides water for 25% of our nation's crops. And TransCanada has already told us that there's gonna be very little to no oversight on this pipeline at all, and that their detection system cannot detect a pinhole leak in the system capable of spewing out 700,000 gallons of oil a day. So we're looking at potentially destroying the largest water aquifer in North America, just so TransCanada can ship their oil through the United States over to China and India. And we have no reason to believe they're any more responsible than BP, who of course can completely destroyed the entire Gulf Coast, still destroyed to this day, or Chevron that destroyed the Amazon. Uh, just history after history tells us that the way that we can tell that the oil, oil industry lobbyists are lying to us is just watch their lips. When they're moving, Absolutely. we probably are involved with a huge lie. No, no question, if things go wrong in that water aquifer, it's not reversible in about 15 seconds. Tell me, uh, tell me how bad that is. Well, it's essentially going to destroy 25% of our nation's crops. It's going to make water undrinkable for about 12 states in this country. But, you know, the Keystone One pipeline has experienced one oil leak per month in its operation. And we have oh, no it, reason to believe that this Keystone XL is going to be any different. Farron Cousins, thanks for joining me. Thank you. The Obama administration might be stifling whistleblowers in the federal government, but over in the private sector, whistleblowers are serving an important role in exposing fraud. Joining me now to talk about the latest example of corporate wrongdoing that whistleblowers uncovered is attorney Chris Polis. Chris Amgen incorporated in the news again, scamming the American public, scamming taxpayers and scamming patients. Tell us this story. Well, Pap, you're absolutely right. Amgen just got hit for about $29 million fine. Uh, it's actually a settlement that they've entered into with the Department of Justice. Uh, some of the fine work done out of the state of South Carolina by uh, Assistant Attorney General Bill Nettles uh, has brought these folks to the table to pay a pretty hefty fine for again ripping off the Medicaid, Medicare programs uh, and other benefit programs that our government provides to take care of some elderly folks. Uh, in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Well, we're always critical when the U.S. Attorney's Office doesn't do their job, but this, but Nettles got it done here, it appears, this, this particular prosecutor. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is an anemia drug, correct? That's correct. It's a, it's a, it's a crucial drug that folks that, uh, that have diabetes or chronic kidney disease require uh, to go along with some of their dialysis treatments as, as, and, and to keep them alive. So it's an absolutely crucial drug for these folks to have access to.
And, and so this prosecutor understood that not only would the not, not only was the industry churning the process, scamming the process, they were putting patients' lives at risk. And because of that, I think they, the, the criminal penalties and fines were approaching $800 million in this situation. Uh, is that, is that, does that really stop a company from doing the types of things we're talking about here? You know, sadly, Pap, I, I don't think it does. Uh, I think we see time and time again that these companies are slapped with what we would think to be hefty fines. Uh, Amgen is a perfect example of it. They've been hit with fine after fine after fine over the last decade that they've been doing business, and they clearly haven't, uh, it clearly has not had the punitive uh, effect that it should have and that it's designed to have. These companies have just uh, incorporated these types of fines and penalties as a cost of doing business in the pharmaceutical industry in the United States. And so in this situation, Chris, what they were doing is they were actually using doctors in the process. The doctor was actually part of the scam. Was it, weren't these doctors part of the scam too? Yeah, that was, it's a pretty complex process. First of all, it appears that Amgen was trying to compete or at least get a leg up on their comp competition in Johnson & Johnson. They had a drug called Procrit. And so Amgen was trying to secure a, a larger portion of the market uh, with their particular drug, Aranesp. So what they were doing is paying kickbacks to doctors. And in the complaints uh, for the filings in this case, it was called a liquid kickback. And what they were doing was they're overfilling the vials of this medicine. So they're giving doctors more medicine than what they should have been getting in each vial. And then the doctors could then turn around and charge Medicaid and Medicare more uh, for the amount of medicine that they were using. They could get more mileage out of each vial, so to speak. Well, Chris, the doctors clearly had to know what was going on. I mean, the doctors, if they were, act they were actually making money by scamming taxpayers just like Amgen, uh, where, where do you think that'll go, if anywhere? Once, once a case is over like this, it's basically over, isn't it? Uh, you know, it, it pretty much is. Once, once the settlement is entered into uh, with the government, uh, it pretty much exonerates the company. And again, the company doesn't have to admit liability for committing any of these acts, uh, but the dollars that they're willing to pay uh, are, are pretty, it's pretty apparent what's, what's going on. Uh, but, as, but the doctors go, in this, the doctors in this situation who had to, they had to knowingly participate in this scam. There were no prosecutions as far as I can see. No, not that, not that I can tell either, um, and that's not uncommon. Um, doctors are, are somewhat of the middlemen in, the, in these particular uh, scenarios. Uh, the DOJ is focused on going after the large corporations, the folks who are capable of paying these fines, um, and you know, the doctors in this particular instance uh, aren't being prosecuted. Well, in this situation, it wasn't just that they were scamming taxpayers. It wasn't just that the doctors and really, if you think about the company, together were scamming taxpayers, but they were also putting patients at risk with off-label uses of this product, overuse of the product, uses in ways that it was never even intended to be used. Uh, talk mm -hmm. about that just a little bit. Well, you know, off-label use of the product is a use of the drug that it, uh, or it's, the, it's using a drug for things that it's not indicated uh, by the FDA, meaning that it's not approved for those particular uses. Now, it's not illegal for a doctor and their patient to use a drug off-label if they believe it to be an effective treatment for whatever ailment that they may, they may have. But what is illegal is for a pharmaceutical company to encourage doctors to market their drugs in an off-label purpose to healthcare providers. And that's what was going on here. Amgen was marketing, telling doctors to use their drug for these off-label purposes. And what that did is contaminate that doctor-patient relationship. Doctors were getting paid, they were getting uh, incentivized to use these drugs off-label at the risk of their patients. Chris, in about 20 seconds, how did, uh, how did the U.S. Justice Department find out about this case? Uh, they found out through whistleblowers. In fact, this particular case was so large and it, it, it had such a large geographic scope, there were about 11 different people who stepped forward to tell the Department of Justice what was going on. Thank, thank uh, goodness they did, otherwise we'd I, never know about it. Thanks for joining me, Chris. Absolutely. Thanks, Pat. That's it for this week's Ring of Fire, but you can keep up with us throughout the week online at ringoffireradio.com or on Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio and on Facebook. I'm Mike Papantonio, and we'll see you next week right here on Ring of Fire.